Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Mm, welcome back to Think Tech. And this is uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge half moon solar. And we're talking about Molokai today. And of course, our regular guest, if not co host, is Marco Mangelsdorf of ProVision Solar in Hilo. And our special guest today, who joins us by, by Zoom from Chicago, uh, is the CEO of Half Moon Ventures. Half Moon Ventures is doing a project in Molokai. We are so happy to have both of you guys on the show. Welcome to Think Tech. Thank you for having us again today. Yeah. Well, Mike, you were, you were here, what, six months ago? And I uh, thought it was great to, um, you know, to talk with you and have a, an angle, a, a view into um, building solar, building a, uh, an ambitious solar project on Molokai. Because uh, Molokai isn't easy. Molokai is not like the rest of the islands in its own way. Molokai has its own persona, and it's special. And so, and, and, and I, might, I might add that um, um, Marco has done a lot of work as a, as a, as a provision installer on Molokai, and he's very familiar with the territory. And what I'd like to talk to you both about today is this project that Mike is doing um, for Half Moon Ventures um, on Molokai, and it's a solar and battery installation. Very important to move the needle in the, ahead in the state of Hawaii. So um, welcome to the show to you too, Marco. Say hi. Hi, Jay. Hi, Mike. Uh, again, really pleased to be back on with both of you, and especially you, Mike, because as Jay was saying, Molokai is, uh, is and has been for a very long time very near and dear to my heart, and uh, it's great to get an update from you being uh, the principal there at Half Moon Ventures and the Molokai New Energy Partners to learn uh, the good, great news and kind of where we go from here after the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission gave formal approval with some conditions uh, back on July 30th some couple, for yep. <laughs> uh, your, your company and for Maui Electric to go ahead and move forward. So it's, uh, I very much look forward to what you have to share with us. So thank you so much for being on with us, Mike. Yeah, congratulations yeah, exactly. on the approval, you, Mike. So uh, can you tell us, uh, you know, the general nature of the project? And uh, you've been working on it, what, for a couple of years now? Yeah, we, um, we acquired this project uh, three years ago from another developer, uh, Princeton out of California, um, who had been struggling to get the project moving forward, but they secured some good foundations for us. But we really didn't expect that it was going to take um, over three years of in additional development work to, uh, to get this thing across the finish line. But um, as everyone's aware in Hawaii is that it is, um, there are some additional challenges that are posed by um, doing business in Molokai, just you know, just geographically being isolated, and there's a lot of other factors that we had to take into consideration that we don't in some other project areas. So um, overall, I mean, three years of development, you know, to secure the land, to complete the interconnect studies with NICO, do the resource assessment, do the environmental impact assessment, um, start going through the the PPA negotiation process, and so there's there's just a number of elements that we needed to do in this particular project that we haven't necessarily been exposed to in some other places. Mm, yeah, well, you know, is, why are you into this? I mean, are you into it for, to make big bucks, Mike? Or are you into it to do altruistic deeds for Hawaii State? Um, what, or, or are you one of those guys who just loves the technology? Or is it all three? Um, actually, it's, um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, my college roommate was um, George McGovern's grandson, and so I got familiar with the Sierra Club back in the early 90s, um, but I did a different course. I, I studied Chinese in college, and I lived in Asia for um, well over 10 years, and um, we were taking, I was working in investment banking, and we were taking a lot of big, dirty SOE companies public, um, coal companies, oil companies. And uh, I, you know, over the time I was there, from '92 to 2003, uh, the environment deteriorated rapidly, and you could just, you know, the, the health impacts were extreme on people. And I, my son was born in Hong Kong, and and so um, I really became a like a. This, I just realized the world can't sustain eight billion people driving Cadillac SUVs. So we need to do something about this, and. Um, so I actually resigned from my position in Asia and came back, and we started a renewable energy company called Half Moon Power 
uh, that originally was focused on utility scale wind projects in the mainland. Um, I'm from the Midwest, Wisconsin. Um, and we developed a, our initial foray was a portfolio of about 800 megawatts of wind projects in the Midwest. And so we continued to grow with the industry. We went from <clears throat> from solar, from wind to solar, and then now energy storage. And um, we've been very fortunate to um, have some interesting opportunities come across our our, our lab here since uh, since we got into energy storage four years ago. And uh, we've kind of just stuck with it. And to us, really, the the missing link right now to Getting to 100% renewables is going to be storage, and so that's how that's how things kind of got started. And you know, we've you know we're not uh, we're not fly by night charlatans trying to make a quick buck out of this stuff. It's something that you know is permanent in nature. Well, um, what kind of issues have you? I mean, you've been doing business in various places. Hawaii isn't <coughs> it's not the only place you've done projects, and I wonder how you would come. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I just took a <coughs> trip to Dallas on behalf of, <coughs> of ThinkTech. And um, yeah, that helps if you drink a little water. <coughs> I just took a trip to Dallas and got on a, a couple of planes. And before you know it, I was, I was this, uh, a cold. Anyway, what I wanted to ask was you've done business in other places. And Molokai mm -hmm. and Hawaii, they're different. How have you found them to be different? Have you found resistance to the project? Have you found a business environment that, that is as easy as other places? So, I mean, it's, um, it, it's remarkable no matter where you go. I, I take the view that people are all the same. Um, you know, particularly here in, in the Midwest, you know, I, I grew up in Wisconsin, not on a farm, but it was, you know, I grew up in Milwaukee. and. We did a lot of wind farm development in, in very rural communities. And the thing about small communities is that you've got different dynamics that you don't see in big cities. There's, you know, in big cities you have anonymity, but in small towns you got everybody knowing each other and you got generations going back and you got stories that just follow along with different families. And so I think Molokai is kind of similar to a lot of the places we did wind farm development in that, you know, it's just got, you know, generations of history there between different families and politics and so forth that, you know, make it a little more quirky, I guess, than, than doing something in a more anonymous place like New York City. Um, but I, you know, honestly, um, I think our approach is a little bit different too. You know, we, we just take time to get to know people and expect that it's not going to happen overnight. So we, we try not to be impatient. Yeah. Well, it sounds like China, you know, learning the community uh, by developing Guanxi with individuals one at a time. And yep. After a while, you you know you're accepted. So, what have you done to try to gain acceptance in Molokai, and how well has it worked? And if you could look back now, uh, would you change anything in, in your mo on that on that score? I mean, I, I I would always answer that by saying I wish we would have had been able to spend more time there. Um, I probably have made a dozen visits over the past three years, and I've literally met, you know, hundreds of people there, and not 100% support at all. There's definitely a few people who are concerned about this and us and anything else that's kind of new, I guess, for the community. Um, but we've tried our best to listen as much as possible in different formats, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or big community meetings. But we've done as much as we can physically do to, to kind of really hear what they want to hear. Um, or, sorry, hear what they have to say, and then, you know, we try to tailor the project so it kind of fits with their needs. But at the end of the day, these projects are all the same, whether they're in New York or Molokai. It's, um, you know, you're talking about solar and batteries and the different prices, different construction costs, but it's still fundamentally the same thing. Well, has, has there been a resistance from the community? Have people raised objections in the course of your discussions, either publicly or privately? I mean, what do you, do you feel there's any pushback, or is it all... Um, you know, at least um, on the surface, a, an acceptance. Been, yeah, I mean, again, I, I, if I had to throw out numbers, and then these are, don't hold me to these, but I would say it's been well over 90% of the people that we've met with have been very supportive or indifferent to the project. But there's been a few people that, you know, that are a little more close to the industry that um, have raised some objections about, you know, could we have done this cheaper? Could we have done this? 
um, with more community benefits. There's there's all kinds of different things that you know they they, they think that are worth discussing and. We've had these conversations and they're ongoing. It's not like we're, we're done with the community. It's still gonna to continue to, to go on. So we're gonna be there for the next 22 years. So there's gonna be more opportunity for us to, to kind of win over some of these remaining people. It's ongoing, isn't it? It's not just a matter yep. of getting their buy-in in the beginning. You have to keep on getting their buy-in going forward. You wanna maintain the right relationship with not only the individuals who are close to you, but the larger community as well, no? Yeah, for sure. No, it's, um, it, well, again, it's going to be for the tw next 22 years, so I, I may not even be around when the thing is, is done. It might be my, might be my kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, in 22 years, I feel certain that I'll get rid of this cold. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so, so now you've got approval on July 30, uh, as Marco mentioned, um, and the question is, what, what does that entitle you to do? And, why can't we just, uh, you know, put a spade in the ground and build this thing right now today? Well, there's still remaining work to be done. We have to do a complete environmental impact assessment. Uh, we have to do some more cost estimates. Uh, we're we're going out for bid right now to get to really fine tune the the, the cost price right now, and that's going to take some additional work. But we expect to break ground here in the next maybe 90 days or so. Oh, that's pretty good. Um, there's some additional, there's, there's still some additional cleanup work we need to do with the Public Utilities Commission and the Consumer Advocate. Um, but we, you know, and there's some remaining, we have to go and file our building and electrical permits with Maui County and so forth. So there, there is some additional work to be done, but it's uh, relatively low risk in nature. The, the big thing for us is getting, you know, not just the PPA approved, um, but the PUC to approve the project as well. Oh, okay. So once once you get that approval that you had on on July, July 30, was it? Um, then you need another yeah. approval. You, in, you'd have to negotiate the, the purchase power agreement right now with them. I suppose you're working on that right now with Maui Electric, no? No, that's already been negotiated. That's done. Okay. The, the power purchase agreement is complete. That, that's been... Um, actually, it's published on the PUC website. Okay. All right. Okay. So, yep. um, wh where do you where do you expect? Well, you know, from where we are right now, plus 90 days to put a spade in the ground, um, plus the time of construction, completion, and turn on the switch. How far is it going to be? How, how much time? Well, the, oh man, the, 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 we're trying to estimate that. Honestly, it's um, the logistics are a little bit more challenging because of the restrictions on the port, you know, there's, we can't really bring certain size um, equipment in and so forth, and we're just trying to take an inventory of what's available locally. So there's a lot of uh, work here to kind of just find out how we can do this the most economically. Um, but if everything goes well, and it never does, um, <laughs> it, it, it could be done in as little as eight months. Oh, okay. uh, it's probably going to be like next summer, third quarter next year before it's operational would be my guess. Yeah, I'd like to ask Marco to come in and, uh, and ask, ask you more to flesh out exactly uh, you know, what, you, what you have achieved so far and what you still need to achieve to actually finish the, the project so it's you know, on the ground. Oh, thanks, Jay. First, I, I want to Marco. State, state my bias up front, which is that I believe that the Public Utilities Commission made the right decision two weeks ago. The, there is no such thing as an absolutely perfect power purchase agreement, uh, and seeking perfection should not be the enemy of, of the good. And uh, I just want to uh, to state that, you know, being a contractor who has pursued projects over the past uh, 15 years here in Hawaii and having done projects on Molokai for 11 now that uh, I, I know something about the challenges of, of the, the process from start to finish in terms of proposing a project uh, of that magnitude, which you're, what you and your, your team are doing, Mike, and I, I really do uh, salute your perseverance and your dedication, your commitment, and, and not a trivial amount of money, time, resources that you all have spent to make this happen, and I do think that it's uh, it's going to be overall a very positive thing for for the Friendly Isle. 
uh, once it goes online and for, for years and decades to come. So, and I'm not even buttering you up for anything in particular. I just want to recognize from one contractor, one developer to another, even you guys are on a much larger scale than my, my small company here in Hilo. But uh, I really do... Uh, Salute you all. Look, for every, for, I, I know you feel the same way, Marco, but every time you see a solar panel get installed, you just think that's one, one, one less that we need to do. You know, it's, it's just it's going to be ongoing until yeah. we get to 100 percent. So, right. What do they say? One, one small step for mankind. Yeah. Um, and we're going to take a small step too. We're going to take one minute break, Mike and Marco, and okay. then we're going to come back and we're going to talk more about what needs to be done and what this project is gonna look like at the end of the day, hopefully in, in eight months. Um, this is ThinkTech, and more specifically, it's Energy 808, the cutting edge, the half moon solar battery project on Molokai. We'll be right back. Aloha, I am Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Cold Green for ThinkTech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at three, and I have really, really exciting guests on the exciting topic of energy efficiency. Hope to see you there. And aloha, my name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation, and we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Okay, we're studying Molokai today on Energy 808, the cutting edge. And we have Marco Mangelstorf, who's a, who's a solar installer out of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Uh, and we have Mike Hastings, who is doing Half Moon, uh, who, is, who is Half Moon Ventures, he's CEO, and they're doing a, uh, a, a solar and battery project on Molokai. Both of these guys have a familiarity with Molokai, so it's very interesting to talk about the one project within the view of the two, the two business guys who do projects on Molokai. So as we left it, you know, Marco, I, I think you were gonna actually frame a question um, yes, to Mike, and you were going to ask him about, you know, uh, what the process has been, the experience has been, and what the experience will be like going forward. Yeah, and I'm going to ask a little bit of a pointed question here, Mike, uh, but not too pointed, I, I hope, which is uh, I, along with you, I'm sure, read uh, Commissioner Jenny Potter's concurring opinion uh, on the decision that was announced two weeks ago, and she brought up mm -hmm. a number of, uh, of rather interesting and somewhat provocative points. And uh, specifically, uh, I'd like to hear your response to the, the criticism that has come uh, from a number of parties that uh, your company is, what, what you're charging in the power purchase agreement is and this is my word, excessive or high compared to other utility scale solar plus storage projects that have already been approved in the state and specifically mm -hmm. uh, the last two that uh, our friends at KIUC on Kauai approved with both uh, with Tesla and SolarCity and then AES. So how, how do you respond to, to that observation that, in other words, why are you guys so high comparatively speaking? We We've been negotiating price on, on equipment for, for several years, and during the, um, there's really three main reasons why it's more expensive, and um, a lot of it is the abundance of caution. So there's a lot of redundancy built into the system that you don't have in some other ones, because this will be kind of like the, the base load generation for the entire island. This, is, this represents um, over 40% of the island's energy, so we've had to build in some extra caution. But we're also being relied on for a lot of functionality in our energy storage system that's not being requested from the other projects. So most um, solar projects are kind of, or solar and storage are just like, it's just like time shifting. So you charge a battery during the day and discharge it at night. That's all that's required of you. Those batteries are significantly cheaper. So is the inverter system that makes it all work together. Um, so we've been asked to provide, you know, help with ramp rate control, frequency regulation. Um, we, we've got to, you know, we've got to have contingency reserves. So we've had, and we've got to build some redundant lines in case there's, um, you know, some weather event that, that uh, causes an outage. So, 
uh, we've had to do a lot of extra things on the technology side that weren't required for some other projects in other islands. Uh, but the third part is that, you know, just given the, the logistical challenge of building and the smaller island is, you know, there, there is some additional cost there. You know, we have a lot more plane tickets, a lot more hotel rooms to bring in people and so forth that you don't have in some of the other islands. So uh, between those three things, that has that um, significantly increased the cost. But in general, this is a very competitive rate um, in, in my mind. So uh, just last year, we built two solar-only projects in Rhode Island. And that CPA rate was 20 cents, and we're, our blended average over 22 years is 17 cents. So um, even in the mainland, you're seeing rates that are significantly higher. And if you also consider that the average resident of Molokai pays close to 40, 50 cents uh, per kilowatt hour uh, year over year, that this does represent a savings to people. So, you know, if you look at some of the recently approved projects, I think even in the latest RFP, I won't be surprised if some of these rates are in like the eight to nine cent area for Oahu and Maui and, and maybe even the Big Island. Um, but a lot of those are standalone solar. So it's really when you when you factor in the battery, which basically doubles the cost of the project, um, <coughs> that that's where that extra cost goes into. But 17 cents was kind of like the avoided cost target that we were trying to hit to to, to be below what what it cost them to do uh, diesel ads. So, nonetheless, it, it may seem higher, but it's, it's, I, I still think it's competitive, and we made our case to the PUC, and, you know, with reservations, um, uh, Potter did uh, approve this as well, or vote in favor of this as well. You know, Mike, this raises a couple of uh, questions in my mind. Um, num number one is, um, the, you talked about the additional things you have to do because this would be, you know, the base generation of power for the island. Uh, th those are those are things that you've been required to do. That's what the implication of your comment was, right? That you've been told you yeah. have to you have to build this with um, you know special um, special um, uh, backup and special res resilience, um, so that uh, as as the base load you don't go down. Am I right? That, that's correct, and that's that, that, there's nothing to add to you. said it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's going to cost more. It's just obvious it's going to cost more. The other thing is you, you mentioned yeah. 20, 22 years. Does it stay at 17 cents for the 22 years or other increments? That's the blended average. Actually, the initial rate, and, uh, man, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, my mind is I'm not recalling, but I think it's like 13, 14 cents in the start year, and then it ends at, like, 20 two cents of the average cost per kilowatt hour over the term. This is how HECO calculates, you know, this is the average kilowatt hour over the entire contract. Right. So that, that's 17 cents. So you yeah. take the it risk as significantly it, lower. You take the risk as it goes mm -hmm. forward to keep it in good shape, whatever happens, you still have to provide that power at that stated agreed rate, right? So the further yeah, you, you go yeah, out, the more risk the, you take. Yeah, there's also the degradation. So you're looking at a reduction of half of a percent per year in the solar output just because of the degradation of the cells. So over 20 years, you lose about 20 percent of your um, generation capacity. Uh, similar figures for, for the storage piece as well. Yeah. There's a lot of wear and tear over that term. Yeah. So is this um, new high-tech equipment you're using? I mean, you, you alluded to, uh, you know, that possibility. Uh, is this going to be right at the cutting edge? Yeah, I mean, we've um, got a couple of these systems in the mainland. Um, we're, we're contracting with SNC Electric out of Chicago. Uh, they manufacture these converters to provide that additional ancillary services that um, Miko needed to help with the uh, grid control. Um, so, it, it, yeah, it is high tech. It is definitely high tech, and these things are high maintenance as well. So it's, um, you know, compared to, you know, a plain vanilla solar array, that's very standard now. You can, you know, those are not as hard to do. But when you're providing, you know, kind of like microgrid controls, that that is definitely in the realm of, in my mind at least, high tech. Yeah. You know, we went over to uh, Molokai and made a little movie there on energy in general about six months ago, and we talked with Amelia Vanderhoff. And one of the issues that came up in that discussion was um, some sort of notion she said that some people had uh, where they wanted to be part of your project. 
They wanted to have uh, either some percentage off the top, or they wanted to have some ownership in it. Did those discussions go anywhere? What's the status of that? I mean, we, we continue to, to talk. I, I actually just talked with Amelia a couple weeks ago. Um, and, you know, I, I consider us to be friends, actually, because we share the same vision of getting Molokai to 100% renewables. And, you know, we're, we're happy to continue um, talking with the community about different ways to participate in, in the project. And, you know, whether it's financial or just, just having the benefits of better power quality, um, there are numerous ways that, that the community can get involved. Um, but, you know, we, you know, those, con those conversations are still ongoing. And, um, you know, we, you know, it, we, we did have actually inserted into the PPA specific language that um, enables, it facilitates the beginning, I don't know what that means, facilitates the beginning of the conversation between the island of Molokai plus ECO to, to talk about potentially having community ownership of the project. Mm. Well, that so would we, be... We, we have, yeah. That would be uh, not, a first, not, wouldn't it? That would be a first where the community owns a piece of the project, no? Well, the KAUC is, isn't it, too? That's Okay. Kind of, uh, <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Touche. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, well, you know, I, I only want to ask about the other community leader that you and I mentioned before the show, and that's Walter Ritty, who is a, a no, no, noticeable, a notable community leader in Molokai for many, many years. And I wonder mm -hmm. what your discussions with him have been like, and and uh, what kind of um, you know acceptance has he expressed of the project? I, I frankly was scared to meet him because I was I heard you know like you know that he <laughs> could hurt me or something <laughs> uh, physically or some other way. Um, so no, I'm kidding. He was a really nice guy, and uh, we had a we had dinner together um, at Molokai Burger and uh, with his wife, and we had a really nice conversation and. Um, he uh, he actually was somewhat supportive. I was um, I didn't know what to expect honestly because I'd heard so many great stories about how important he is in Hawaiian history and um, you know he 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 was I, I really enjoyed our meeting and I met him one on one other occasion after that as well and he uh, again I think he's just renewable energy minded too and you know he wants to see all of Hawaii get 200 percent renewables and stop importing oil. Yeah. Oh yeah. He said that for many years. And a shout out for Molokai Burger. I, I've been there. That's where I spent some time on my movie trip. And I got to say, it's a great yeah. place. Molokai Burger. Yay, Molokai Burger. It is an awesome place. So, Marco, you wanted to ask some questions about the, you know, the uh, what will we see in this project when it is completed, right? Yes. Uh, so, in the little time we have left, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about battery storage. I mean, uh, in the trenches here in Hawaii, as throughout much of the mainland, uh, if you happen to be a Tesla dealer, which we are, or the other major supplier of residential storage uh, is LG Chem, is that the reality is uh, that uh, it's uh, scarce. The product, there's product scarcity right now, and prices have actually gone up in the past six months. So, my question to you, Mike, is. What what kind of battery storage will you be using, and how confident are you about both availability and pricing in the time frame uh, that we're talking about? So what's interesting is you're probably aware one of the big bottlenecks is not just manufacturing capacity, but it's also an over-reliance on cobalt, which comes from right. uh, pretty shaky places like uh, the Congo. Um, so we've uh, actually been using LG. Um, for, for our project, uh, primarily because they're they're so committed to the space and they're they're very they're very they've got a very mature product and they have great um, logistics and they, they they can deliver in several months when you're talking about utility scale stuff. But right now this year there's been an abundance of installations going on in Korea in their home market. Um, but next year uh, supply is, looks very good and so we've um, we've been circling back and forth with them about. Uh, supplying the cells for this particular project, but you know, again, there's there's a lot of good manufacturers out there, whether it's Samsung or LG or um, Panasonic or Toshiba, Tesla. I mean, there's there's definitely an abundance of choices, um, and we we're confident that because of this number of choices, the price of storage will continue to drop. Uh, but it is taking some time for these guys to ramp up manufacturing, and I I wouldn't you know blame Tesla for their you know because all their production is going into the Model 3 to help meet their demand, and they had to make a decision strategically that, hey, we're going to supply cars, not not power walls. Um, 
whatever has just been their that's just been their choice. But um, no, we've been very happy with uh, with LT. They're they're both their um, pre-purchase and post-purchase uh, service has been fantastic. Okay, well, uh, let me. Well, we're, we're about out of time, Marco. Uh, why don't you ask one more question? How critical is it for you, Mike, uh, for tax credit purposes to get this project placed into service by the end of 2019? Well, that was another reason why we, we, we argued that it was important to get this thing done in an accelerated time frame so that, as you know, the ITC starts phasing out at the end of next year. Um, we were also fortunate to secure a new market tax credit allocation for this, and those are that's not something that comes out every year. So we got significant subsidies, which enabled us to drop our price to the point where Nico needed it. So it's really important that we that we have that we reach commercial operation by the end of 2019. Mm. Well, Mike, you're not only a businessman; you're an environmentalist, and you have broad horizons. And I wonder if you could take a minute here at the close to tell the people of Molokai and to tell the people of Hawaii why they should want to support this project? Um, again, it's, you know, Hawaii to me has always been ground zero um, for renewables just because it's so need-based. You've got a fantastic resource. You have a bunch of small island grids that have historically uh, not been able to, you know, function as, as, as well as some other places. and. Um, so there, there's it's just an extraordinary opportunity to, to, to demonstrate to the world and be an inspiration to the rest of the world to, to get to 100% renewables. And, you know, it, it, it starts in Hawaii and it's going to work its way uh, uh, eastward from there. I mean, it's um, my I, I live in a state that's uh, frankly kind of retarded when it comes to renewable energy policy. And um, I just I admire I, I admire Hawaii a lot. Let's put it that way because mm -hmm. um, of the the vision to, to promote 100% renewable standard. Well, Marco and me, we admire you a lot, Mike, and we admire what you're doing, and, and uh, we support you. And let me, let me also add that, um, you know, this project is somehow iconic because it's the base load in Molokai, because Molokai has waited a long time to have a project like this, and it, it will be iconic, and we wish you all the best. Marco, do you agree with me? No, absolutely, and I hope that we can reconvene this uh, self-mutual uh, admiration trio in six months, if you might, and, uh, and uh, get a, an update about all the tremendous pro progress that hopefully will be made. <laughs> thank you, Mike Great, Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Marco. Appreciate we'll see you next time. To talk with you again today. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for appearing. Aloha.